Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Corcoran Entertainment Show. I'm your host, Frankie Corcoran, as always. Uh, as you can see, for those of you who are watching the video version, you notice we got this new little fancy piece of equipment here, which is just a little microphone stand. Uh, it's much easier on my back now because before it was right here and I was trying to, you know, good angle with the camera. And uh, but um, this is much easier on my back now. <laughs> <laughs> much easier um and so we will have a little bit more equipment coming in within the uh, coming weeks so uh we'll hope you know make the, the audio sound better and uh we're looking to hopefully do some more in-person episodes as these covid restrictions are dying down a little bit uh day by day uh we're hoping we're hoping anyway that that's the plan and um you know change up the studio a little bit because it's not even really a studio it's just my bedroom office uh, <laughs> which I mean, Hey, it's better than nothing. It's cozy. It's warm, but, uh, yeah. So, um, I'm not really sure where I'm going with that. I just go on tangent sometimes. And, uh, that's why I should have a little assistant here to just shut me up whenever I, <laughs> whenever that happens. Uh, so yeah, our first guest today, actually our only guest today, uh, we're very, very excited about. He is a RBC Olympian who has been an athlete, uh, most of his life where in uh, 2016, he actually played for his first team Canada and, uh, he went to Mexico, won three medals in, in, in the individual races. He also raced at the World Cups Marathon World Championships, having raced in Hungary, Germany, and Romania. And uh, he is none other than Mr. Brett Himmelman. Uh, we are very excited to have him on here today. And uh, I met him at the uh, Rising Youth in Action event that happened here in Miramichi back in November. And uh, I was blown away by his story and his experiences and uh, just what he had to tell us all and the advice he gave us. And so... Uh, there was no better guest really to have today. Like, you know, this was really, I was really honored that uh, he was willing to come on and uh, yeah. So I'm really excited. Uh, we got a pretty good show for you plan today. Brett will talk about his uh, very impressive sports uh, resume and uh, we'll also be dishing a little bit on uh, what else is going on in uh, the entertainment world. Um, uh, we will be talking a little bit about the uh, Dwayne, the rock Johnson and uh, Vin Diesel feud. And uh, Brett will also be giving his thoughts on the Spider-Man multiverse I know for some of you uh, regular viewers of the show, you're probably like, oh, you're talking about Spider-Man again. This, well, I mean, you know, it's 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 important. Spider-Man No Way Home really saved the box office, you know, with all with the uh, pandemic, you know, um, shutdowns and uh, the movie theaters uh, sales going down and everything. No Way Home really saved that. And so uh, Brett will also be giving his thoughts on that. And uh, so, yeah, so let's just uh, get the show on the road. and. Uh, well, roll the intro. Well, roll the intro. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Corcoran Entertainment Show. Uh, I'm your host, again, Frankie Corcoran. Again, that doesn't change. Uh, and we are now joined by uh, athlete Brett Himmelman, uh, as, as I uh, introduced him in the intro, uh, RBC Olympian, uh, three-time medalist, you say? Or... Um, yeah, so I've, uh, I've uh, won, it uh, depends on the competition you're talking about, I've, uh, I've won three medals at Canada Games, I got the two Canada Games records uh, when I, uh, I've also won a few international medals as a, as a junior and um, uh, have won uh, 31 uh, medals at nationals. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are silver. I'd like them to be gold, but uh, at the same time, like uh, uh, you, uh, you take what you can get, and uh, you always try to strive to be better. But uh, no, yeah, well, there, it's uh, all you can do, man. That's all you yeah, can do. Exactly. So, well, there. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate you coming on. This was it's, it's an honor, really. No, it's uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Like, I mean, it was uh, it was great meeting you when I was up in Miramichi. Yeah, God, that would have been two months ago now. Yeah, two uh, months ago. Yeah, no time yeah. flies, man. It really does. And yeah, now it seriously done. does. Like, it, it almost feels like yesterday some days. And it's kind of crazy how different kind of between the pandemic and everything else. It's uh, has changed so much since then. Uh, but uh, no, it's uh, it's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me on. No, absolutely, man. And uh, speaking of the pandemic, it's interesting because, uh, you know, of course, I'm starting a theater troupe and it's really hard to work to uh, do shows and stuff like that during a pandemic because, you know, audience, indoor capacity, and stuff like that. So how, how has sports been affected for you with the pandemic? It's been it's it's certainly been a bit of a change. But I mean, compared to what theater has suffered, how's how's it been for you guys? 
Yeah, I mean, Feather, I think, has suffered more than sports um, substantially, really, like, um, especially for me, since where I do is an outdoor sport. Um, I was able to start training on the water before uh, most sports. So um, paddling got an exemption from the Nova Scotia government, probably in around May 2020, uh, where we were able to like paddle on the lakes and kind of do socially distance organized training groups. But we were there almost a month before like hockey players could get back in the rinks and um, like indoor sports could even be considered um, uh, to happen. And I know theater has been affected uh, greatly just because uh, a lot of it is uh, indoors in such close quarters. Um, it makes it really difficult. Um, but uh, we've been pretty lucky in that sense that we're an outdoor sport. And uh, when we're in our own individual boat, like you're never within six feet of anybody anyway. Hmm. But uh, the big thing that's been impacted for us has been uh, competitions in training camps. Um, every yeah every single year since I was um, about 15 years old we went down to Florida for a training camp but with the uh, with the border being closed and uh, uncertainty there uh, we actually had to go west of BC so we actually did our training camp in the winter this year in British Columbia which um, yeah which I mean BC is a lot warm like the a lot warmer than anywhere else in this country but we still also had the lakes freeze over us on us like we're there preparing for Olympic team trials and like our 2021 season and we ended up having the lake freezing over there was one day our um, there was so much snow we got 70 centimeters of snow in one night and lake froze over we couldn't paddle and we ended up going sledding which was supposed to be at our warm weather training camp <laughs> oh well there <laughs> not so warm <laughs> yeah exactly it's uh i mean like uh we had a beautiful setup in british columbia like um the lake was the lake was amazing i think it's still one of the most scenic places i paddled like kind of like nestled in between like mount baldy and um, kind of the horizon there is a nice big lake. It was like, if you did a whole perimeter to lake, you're probably around 15 kilometers. But um, I, uh, I'm very excited to be going to uh, San Diego this year for my warm weather training camp. Uh, I'm going to be heading there on February 19th. So uh, I'll be heading there uh, to at least uh, get a little bit more of a tan. I think this is probably the, uh, <laughs> the most I've looked like Casper the ghost. Um, in a, a- <laughs> so so how does that whole thing work you got to self-isolate when you get there or how is that whole because it's no, different everywhere so, yeah we don't we don't need to self-isolate when we're there they're pretty wide open actually i mean like we know how the u.s is right now like they're they have very little restrictions uh compared to us so uh when i get there it's going to be uh, prob- probably the least restricted i've been since um uh this whole pandemic started really so I mean, I'm kind of looking forward to that at some point in time, but at the same time, I'm still going to take the proper precautions because the last thing I need to do is get COVID and have to sit out for a week of training or even worse, not be able to get back home to Canada afterwards. No, absolutely. You know, end up getting stuck there for God knows how long because, you know, the on un- un- the unpredictable nature of this whole thing. Uh, so speaking of traveling. Tell us a little bit about your experiences, because uh, I mentioned in the intro that you you went to Mexico, Germany, Romania. What were those experiences like? Yeah, so I've uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to travel to some pretty cool countries array. So the um, uh, my latest uh, place where I was able to travel to was Romania for the uh, Canoe Marathon World Championships. And uh, it's uh, an Eastern European country. And it's uh, it's it's quite a crazy just to kind of look around like the atmosphere and the environment, how different each country is. Like um, when we had our opening ceremonies for uh, the event, um, we had it in the uh, square in the city of Potesti. And uh, you look around and almost uh, like all the uh, buildings are like Soviet Union era buildings. And um, like just the way they had the opening ceremony set up, I, I thought it was almost in like the Hunger Games. What it looked like, <laughs> like the, the stone uh, uh, brick buildings with like the flags and everything like um, and it's yeah, like each country was uh, like is so different. Um, like Mex- when I raced in Mexico, um, we were in a town that where half the town didn't even have power. Oh, really? <laughs> in, in most of the buildings. So we um, we were in southern Mexico um, in a place called uh, Panico, which is in the Veracruz state. And uh, we were we were paddling on a river and uh, just the event that was put on there is their first time ever hosting uh, a big international paddling event like that. Uh, they even canceled school, I think, for two of the days and they bust all the kids in to go watch the races. Oh, go away, eh? 
yeah it was like such a such a big deal for the local population uh just be like oh my goodness like canadians are here in in our town um but it was uh it was such a phenomenal place to kind of travel and explore to and uh that that for me was the first time where i really traveled somewhere completely new on my own like i wasn't there with my parents like i was just there with my team and my coaches and um it was just uh it, it was a real like eye-opening experience and i was like wow like our, our world is so vastly different depending on where you go. Like um, in 2018, I um, uh, was on the World Cup team and I got to go to Hungary and Germany. So you do um, two, um, two competitions. You spend a week in Germany. You race on the or, uh, first one was Hungary, a week in uh, Hungary. You race that weekend. Then at the end of the competition, you take a plane over to Germany. You're a week there and then you race at the end of that week and then you go home. But the contrast between Hungary and Germany uh, was a really cool experience because when I go to Hungary, everything like it was like cobblestone roads, big churches, like um, like a lot of history within their infrastructure there. But then when I go to Germany, like it's uh, it's still like very like different. Uh, unique um, like with the culture there like Hungary is a bit more Eastern European but mm. then uh, Germany was uh, much more modern but you could still see like the history of Germany with like the buildings and and I think the uh, the race course in uh, Germany uh, it was in Duisburg Germany which I think is on like the the northwest uh, kind of area of it I think it's still the most beautiful race course that I've got the race in like big big beautiful trees overhanging on the race course and um, just, it was, uh, yeah, I think, uh, like the Hungary and, um, uh, Germany, um, like the, the Seged, um, I, uh, forget the name of like what the, the whole kind of race course is called, but, uh, paddling is actually their national sport there. Oh, okay. So paddling, um, in Hungary is like what hockey is for us in Canada. It's like everything. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's like, it's like that level of excitement. And that's why they always hold so many international events there. Like um, what I think is really, really cool about our sport of paddling is that um, it's, you predominantly see a lot of countries on the podium that you might not see on the podium in other sports. Like you never see Hungary as like a superpower in any other sports really, other than paddling where Hungary is probably one of the big three countries. Mm. Wow. No, 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 man. That's awesome though. Like, you know, you've really been through it all, but, um, tell me this, whenever you kind of look at like, you know, what you've accomplished, I mean, like, you know, of course, having gone to Hungary and Romania and all stuff like that, do you ever take a look or like, uh, uh, look back on it and get like really overwhelmed at the thought of like, wow, like this is what I've done. This is where I am. Like, is it overwhelming? Do you get nervous? Um, or? I mean, I, you always kind of get nervous for what's ahead because especially when, uh, whether you make a junior team, then it's like, all right, the next step I want to do is make a senior team. Or if you make a world cup team, then you want to make the world championship team. You make a world championship team. You want to go to the Olympics. Um, there's always like future goals that you always have kind of had in mind. Um, like for me, when um, I made the World Cup team, I was like, all right, like, that's great. Like I made um, World Cups. I got to go to Europe for two weeks. I got to race. I got to wear the Canada jersey. It's a great experience. But next step I want to do is I want to be on the Canadian national team. I need to start getting paid for this. I need to get funding. I need to get carded. Um, and then like, um, there's one thing of just showing up and doing these races. There's another thing showing up and wanting to get a certain result. No, absolutely. Um, uh so so there's many there's anxiety attacks or... <laughs> um, I mean, there's been times like I, I've honestly felt more uh, anxious for our national races sometimes than uh, some of the international races. Like um, when I was getting lining up for my uh, marathon race in Romania, um, I didn't really have the big nerves in it. I was just like, all right, like I've got to this point. I'm confident in my training. Um, I just have to go out there and perform and paddle the way I do. But then there's been other races um, like uh, national team try uh, tryouts and trials when you're trying out for a team. And you just kind of think to yourself, like, especially in canoeing, there's so many external factors that uh, whether it's the weather or the wind or like, uh, like what lane you're, there's so many things that you can kind of think about and get yourself mm. stressed out about. Um, I, uh, I, I would be lying if I said that I still don't do this a little, but I used to be way worse for it, but I used to be checking the wind like three, four days in advance being like, oh yes, I'm praying it's a, it's a right headwind, something that's a favorable <laughs> wind for me because, um, like the, the my favor. Yeah, the difference between like if the wind's on your face and the wind's on your back can be the difference between 20, 30 seconds on your race. 
And for someone like me, like I, I, I like the race to be as long as I can. Um, I like a bit more time to think. And uh, I've been working over the years to try and be a bit more explosive off the start. But uh, I've been uh, sometimes a notorious starter, kind of like a locomotive where it takes me a little while to get up to speed. But once I get up to speed, I can I can power through and get going. But um, yeah, like uh, it's just a lot of it is just kind of like, all right, like, you know, the anxiety is going to be there um mm. like i like i know i can't completely eliminate the anxiety like it's going to be there it's just um telling yourself that you can you can deal with this this is nothing that you haven't faced before um like what really could go wrong with what's going on like you say like okay if the if it's a non-favorable wind for example like you can either let this cripple your mental preparation or you can say like, all right, this is what it is. Um, I can't uh, only focus on what I can control. Let's uh, let's not focus on what I can't control and just do everything in your power to try and be the best you can. Absolutely. And take the good out of the bad. No, no, it's a really good way to be. And um, I mean, it's definitely a, a, a completely different ball game Cause I mean, like, you know, you said you've been an athlete for, or, or like, you know, in the sports and stuff of that since you were, you know, like what, how old? Just... Yeah, I mean, I was I, I was pretty much born born as a hockey player. I think I was born with a hockey stick and skates on. My dad was a university hockey player, um, so uh, hockey was kind of like uh, like I was I was came from a big hockey family. But then I uh, I started lacrosse uh, when I was eight years old too, just because all my friends in my neighborhood were were all becoming lacrosse players because uh, we had like a local lacrosse coach that got like everybody in my friend group into it. Uh, I still play lacrosse now. I'm uh, going to be playing some. Uh, uh, some post-collegiate semi-pro lacrosse when I go to San Diego as well too and then I uh, just finished my last uh, fifth year of uh, at St. Mary's University lacrosse which was uh, a lot of fun but uh, for me like um, I like being an athlete's always kind of been in my nature and I think even when I'm done being an elite high performance athlete on like the international level I think I'll still always be an athlete in some uh, some some way shape or form whether that's uh, marathon running, which I completed a half marathon like this, this fall, the, the blue nose, which I was like, Oh yeah, that was so much fun. I can do that again. Uh, until like two days later and my knees are so sore. I'm like, wow, I never want to run ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then you just keep on doing it and keep on doing it. You're like, I can't stop. It's yeah. Like- I, I, I think that's something that's just been ingrained in my DNA at this point. So I think I'll, I'll always be doing something. Um, whether that's just still paddling at a national level for my club or like um, playing on the senior lacrosse team or running or whatever it is, I think I'll always be doing something. But um, obviously I won't be able to be an elite high performance level uh, athlete forever. Um, uh, Unlike uh, pro hockey, um, uh, paddling you, there's a, there's no big uh, Reebok sponsorships or, uh, or Nike or uh, big paychecks. Uh, So um, eventually you, you do have to kind of pay the bills itself and, um, uh, going to have to move on. Like, uh, especially in our sport too, like it's, it's, it's a 20, it's a 24 seven, like, um, pretty close to 365. You, you get about three weeks off in the fall, like every year where it's just like, all right, you, you, you put the, you put the boat away, you, you kind of get to go enjoy, maybe you do a vacation or a trip, but really there's about three weeks in the whole year where, um, you're, you're not training. Well, wow, that's great. And, and, and so like a, during like the off season, are you kind of like itching to get back at it? You're like, uh, like, you're like, like, like party. It doesn't enjoy the vacation. Cause you're like, I just want to get back to it. Or is it more so like, you know, this is nice, just a nice little break, you know? Yeah. So it, it, uh, it really depends each year. Like I remember when I was younger, I was always itching to get back on the water. Like when I was 16, I would just finish off nationals and I'd be uh, like, uh, cause when I was younger, I was getting better year after year. Um, I was just coming off of the high of end of the season at national. Like, Oh, I want to get right on the water right away. Like um, I want to like, just start getting ready for next year. Now as like a, a senior athlete and I finished year and I'm just like, Oh my goodness, I got three weeks of vacation. That's so much time. What am I going to do with it? <laughs> um, like uh, this year I took um, like two weeks after my, my season ended later than anybody else um, because my last competition, my last race date was October 1st. Oh, okay. Um, Cause the, uh, the marathon canoe championships was the very last competition of the season for, um, for paddlers. So um, I ended up taking my two weeks off in November and I thought it was really weird. It was like, Oh, it's like, 
it's Thanksgiving. And then I was like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not paddling on uh, Thanksgiving Monday. Like what, what, what is this? This is uh, this is so <laughs> weird to me. This is a, uh, like a, like a foreign concept because normally I get my three weeks in September and it's just like, all right, like around Thanksgiving, it's just like, Oh, I'm finishing my third hard week block. Like I'm feeling really good. And I'm getting back on the water. Like after Thanksgiving, I'm like, Oh my goodness. I feel like I'm about to give birth to a Turkey right now. I'm eating that much over the weekend. <laughs> oh, there you- so, uh, so that party is itching to get back on. Cause you're like, okay, that was great. Now I got to work it all off. Yeah, you know ex- I mean? like, exactly. That's the worst like, part about these like holidays. For me, yeah. For me, it's usually after about 10 days where I'm just like, all right, like I've laid around enough. Like I have spent enough time on the beach or laying around or kind of doing my own thing. Like, all right, I I'm, I'm ready. I got too much energy. I'm ready to start doing some runs, doing some paddles and stuff like that. No, absolutely. And I mean, it's always good to just take time for yourself too. Cause I mean, like, it, it'd be like, Oh no, someone like a carpenter or something like that. Yeah. I'm taking two weeks off. And then next thing you know, they're building a shed or something out in their, in their backyard. It's like some of them don't know how to switch it up, but luckily you've, you, you've been able to find that, that balance. So yeah, I mean, it's gotta I, be I'm, hard I'm, though. I'm sometimes. slowly starting to learn where my off switch is. <laughs> no, there you go. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, per, part of it's a good thing because it shows your dedication and, and, and how, and how dedicated you are. But then it's also like, you know, your family's like, Hey, I never see you anymore. Yeah. So it's like, you know, always going to make time for that. How are you with like a balancing, like your other uh, activities and, and stuff like that? Cause you're also a volunteer uh, dog uh, rescuer, right? With the good bones dog rescue. So um, how do you manage yeah, all so... that and your family between your, 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 your sporting, uh, yeah. So I've done a lot like over the years, like one was a, I fostered dogs like over the years. So like, um, I think I've had seven, uh, foster dogs that I've had in my care before. Um, it started when I was living, uh, with a bunch of my lacrosse teammates in the city and the five of us all were looking after a dog at each other. And, um, for one thing, that dog was, uh, always fed and it was always walked. Um, but sometimes it might be, might get a, a second breakfast or, uh, a second or third walk just because I was like oh who walked the dog today and I was like oh I did I did I did and I was like all right well the dog's been for three walks the dog's going to be fine yeah, um, no, <laughs> uh, but uh, I've also been a volunteer coach uh, for the last uh, three years as well um, or last four years uh, for uh, CPA hockey which is high school hockey um, I coached uh, for four years which uh, there was, it was always a fine balance um, like especially with training camps where you're away for two three months uh, you really do feel like you're missing a lot of stuff at home oh absolutely absolutely um, and you would like, be too um, like I'm I'm away for my birthday like almost every single year and um, like the last like couple of years I wasn't able to do that just because of the nature of the BC camp and isolate 14 day isolations and all that stuff but I used to always fly home for my birthday from Florida every single year oh okay oh wow um, and I used to I used to uh, go home for like five or six days just to like um, from camp just to kind of like rest relax like uh, go see my friends, like get in a different environment. Uh, it can be, it can be really tough being in the same environment that's away from home. Like um, I found was well, something really hard for me being away at training camps is you never really feel fully settled. Like you're kind of like living like out of your suitcase kind of. And it's like, oh, you kind of like have like your room in your bed, but it's not your room in your bed. And like, cause you can move it like uh, any time kind of thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, oh, exactly. It's, um, uh, but, uh, but for me, like, um, uh, the way I kind of see it is that like, all right, like I, I know what times I'm usually going to be home. Like, um, I've been, I've been home for the fall, like, um, almost every single year for like September, October, like, uh, we get to spend a lot of time at home in the summers. Um, I'm pretty fortunate too, that our national team coach, uh, for the last few seasons ha- is based out of Halifax and Dartmouth. Oh, okay. Oh, so So, they're like fairly close to home. You know what I mean? You're not. Yeah, exactly. So if, um, for example, if the national team coach was in Quebec or Ontario, um, I would, I might need to go up to Ontario for, for camps more often than not, where a lot of our camps are going to be here in Nova Scotia, which, um, is, which is very important for me. Like I, I enjoy being home. Like, uh, I do enjoy like traveling, but at the same time too, like, I, I like being settled at home. Like, um, I like, like hanging out, like with my friends and my family and everybody, like it's, it, that's, that's something that's all just really important to me. No, absolutely. And, th- and that's a really good mindset to have because some people, you know, like their, their, their uh, mentality of like, you know, I always got to be working. I, w- I always got to be doing something and they're obsessed with work and can't shut it off. But then they don't realize that it's affecting their family. Like, you know, like their wife who may never see them or their daughter or their son who may never see them. So I'm gl- uh, uh, it's a uh, really good to hear that you found, you were able to find that balance 
and you were able to like you know know when to shut it off and yeah. when to you know kind of take like, it easy like sometimes it can be really hard to like not bring your uh like for example i used to be really notoriously bad like if i had a bad practice i used to let it consume my night because if i had a bad 4 p.m practice i would just be trying to itch to get to that 7 a.m practice the next day just so i can try and put a good practice in my mind no definitely um, it, it can it can be like pretty mentally straining and I've, I've really learned like especially over the last year and a half and over that bc camp is that um when when your training's done for today like like leave leave that mentality and mindset at home because if you're constantly thinking about it it's just going to keep draining you for the next day and uh, a big part of uh, what i'm going to be doing uh with uh rbc uh right now is i'm going to be doing like a series of like burnout presentations uh for okay. uh, some of like the rbc groups and employees and um i'm like right now i'm at the point where i'm at the end of a four week uh training cycle in the winter and this is my this is my first winter training cycle that i've had in the last uh two years because we were away for the fall on the water the whole time uh just to stay on the water uh preparing for olympic team trials and um for the end of an olympic cycle so this is the first time where i've had like okay i'm i'm home for a whole winter cycle it's four weeks i'm in the gym i'm in the pool i'm on the exercise bike i'm running rowing machine um like all that stuff uh if i'm lucky i'll be able to convince our coach to let us play pond hockey on a saturday night <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, that's that's what we uh we did uh saturday morning which um uh, is, is a good, uh, way to break it up. But like at the end of a four week cycle, like, um, you, you wake up and you're like, oh my goodness, like I've done the same weight workout, uh, eight times in the last month. Um, I'm starting to get tired. Like I'm starting to get more sore and it all kind of accumulates up. But if you let it stay in your head mentally, once, once the practice in the day is over, um, you just feel like you never get to recover and be, uh, never get your, yourself ready for the next day or the next workout, whenever that could be. No, exactly. Like constantly like uh, living in the past kind of thing, like always fixated on, oh crap, I made this mistake. And now like, you know, it's, you know, I'm ruined now kind of thing, you know, like some people have that mindset. It's like, you know, definitely don't let that, uh, or like, you know, someone playing basketball, oh crap, if I pass it to him, I could have, I could have won that game. Like, 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 I mean, like, you know, definitely like let the past be in the past, you know what I mean? And then exactly. Just, yeah. And I'm, I've always been a naturally hypercritical person of myself. <laughs> um like I there's times where I could have the best race or the best workout of my life and I'll be still fixating on like maybe the one or two things that didn't go wrong mm. um like uh a, I did 20 push-ups I, I could have did 30 Fuck! Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, like just uh I, I've learned uh, a lot lately that you have to celebrate the little things Mm, absolutely because, absolutely uh, like not not all the big things are guaranteed and you never know when the next time you might need the, you, it, might, it might be a while till you get to celebrate something. So like you, if you do great on an exam in school or like um, you have like a really good time control and practice, like um, it's, it's okay to in, enjoy it or be proud of yourself and be happy about that. And I think that's something that I've uh, uh, come to accept as of late. No, absolutely. And uh, one thing that uh, really stuck out whenever um, uh, I saw you at the uh, Youth in Action event was the whole uh uh, speech you gave about basically i mean like you know no matter how hard things get like never give up on your dreams and stuff like that how did you how long did it take you to get into that mindset where like you know it's like okay i'm not i'm not here right now but i mean like you know if i keep working i'll i'll get there kind of thing like you know like some people some people if they don't make their big break by a certain age like okay that's it i'm done or it like, you know, like someone like Harrison Ford, he was a carpenter when he was like 30 or 40 years old. And then like, you know, 10 years later, he's in Star Wars and Indiana Jones and stuff like that. How long did it take you to get in that mindset? Like, were you ever really like, you know, oh, crap, like, you know, I'm not where I want to be like, you know, I'm never going to get there. Yeah, it's 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 a really it's a really tough question to answer because it's really different for everybody. And I think the big thing that kind of like hit me was when um, I looked at a lot of my older teammates and a lot of other like older successful athletes and realized that their paths weren't all linear either. Um, like when you're, especially in our sport, like where the more time you put on the water at a younger age, like the more improvements and gains you're going to make, like from the year I started the sport in 2013 till about 2018, I got better year after year after year after year. And it was just, everything was just always going up. 
So like, even when you had like a bad practice or a bad race, you were, everything was still like on the upward trajectory. But when you become a senior athlete, it's a lot of up and down and left and right. And it's not, um, like you're, you're not, uh, looking to try and drop 10 seconds off your time year after year. Sometimes you're just trying to gain like a half a second or a second edge year after year. And that, that can be a really hard thing to kind of accept because, um, uh, as a senior athlete, like you're, you're at, you're at the, the top of the top in your country. Um, there, there's going to be ups and downs and every, everybody is looking to be at the, the top of their game everybody's looking to try and be the best in that sense. Um, and in 2018, that was a really polarizing year for me because I had my biggest high where I made a world cup team and I got the race on the, the world international stage for the first time. But then at the national team trials results that year, I also had um, uh, two of my worst results at a national team trials. Like the, the year before in 2017, I ended up making uh, two A finals um, uh, as a senior, but then in 2018, I didn't make any A final as a senior. Um, and despite that, I, um, like went, was like at the, at the high, like I was like, I went to Europe for the first time I was at world cups, but then I also had the low where I also tipped at a trials race that year too, where I fell out of my boat. So oh. that, that was, that was the first year where I was like, um, I, I felt like where I was on top of the world. And I also felt like I was in the lake literally in the sense of that we're there <laughs> literally and um, figuratively <laughs> yeah so it was it was really after that year where I had to realize that it was like okay first things first um, I have to realize why I'm doing this and the reason why I'm doing this is um, I, I enjoy the sport I love being outside I love the activity I love the people around it once I kind of got back to the roots of that then I realized all right like let's go back to the basics of okay just the fundamentals of a canoe stroke and I really got to work with um a coach uh chum who's a longtime canoe coach uh coached um uh anywhere between three or four olympics he's been around forever but um uh, brought me back to the fundamentals of just taking canoe strokes off a dock and oh, every okay. single day that florida i was taking canoe strokes off a dock like just like in, in my canoe position like you're not moving through the water the paddle just moves really slow just to work on just fundamental things and i did that every single morning before I went out on the water every single day. Wow. Wow. So and like baby steps almost like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, slowly work your exactly. Way. And um, like, especially after that past year, you can, you can really dwell on, you can really d- dwell on what you didn't do. Mm. But if you, you have to just look at, it was like, okay, I've done this before. I've shown that I can do this and there's no reason why I can't go above and beyond that. No, exactly. And I mean, like, you know, definitely don't set your, I mean, it's always great to have high expectations too. And then it's also like, you know, it's good not to be overconfident, but you're also yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, just because I'm here right now, it doesn't mean I have to stay this way. Like, you know, like have reasonable, yeah. realistic like expectations. It's, it's, always, but... it's always good to try and reach for the stars, but mm. the worst, the worst thing you can do while you're trying to reach for those is to put a ceiling on yourself. Yeah, exactly. Wow. No, that, no, that's a great analogy. Actually, that's a really, yeah. really, really good, uh, it, good way it, to put you, it. You, uh, you can't, you can't see the stars. We got a ceiling above you. Yeah, exactly. So once, once, once you, once you've kind of removed your own ceiling, then that's, that's when you can keep reaching. No, exactly. Wow. No, that was very well said actually. Uh, and, and, uh, that's that whole uh, speech that you gave at, at, at the event was something that really, really stuck to me. Cause I mean, like, you know, I know lots of people and I've even had it too, where I'm thinking, you know, you know, what am I doing uh, with my life? Like, you know what I mean? Like, is this theater thing ever going to be a big thing, you know, but, but now I've, I've kind of set some like, re- like realistic, reasonable expectations where like, you know, okay, might not be something on Broadway, you know what I mean? It's probably not going to be like that, but I mean, as long as I'm happy and uh, you, you know, the, you know, I'm able to help people and keep them entertained. That's really all that matters in the end for me. And uh yeah. So that, that just really stood out to me. Yeah, and I was exactly. Really, and, yeah. and, and you like, like you, you hit the nail on the head there. Like you, you had the right mindset there where like, okay, like uh, ev- everybody might have their weather for you. It's uh, for feather it's Broadway. Like for me, it'd be winning an Olympic gold medal. Like mm, you always exactly. want, you always want to keep that in mind. You always want to keep that as your goal, but at the same time too, like you always have to have little things to work for along the way. Because, no, exactly. 
Like you, you might be like five, eight, 10 years away from Broadway. I might be like five, eight years away from an Olympic gold medal. You, you never know how far you might be towards your, your top ultimate main goal. And you might never actually get there. But if you set little goals along your way, um, you still feel like you're accomplishing something. You still got to be proud of the work you put put in win or win or lose or like success or fail um you can't just be proud of the end result of everything you do no exactly it's it's the end, the uh, not about the journey not it's about the destination always, yeah or the, the end result is not always something you can control yeah exactly or um it's it's not about the destination the journey i yeah. i i miss said that <laughs> like uh like this year like uh after nationals i ended up having my best nationals result but i was ended up crushed and disappointed because i ended up not making a team that i wanted to make and at that time i couldn't even see that i had my best national result to date where i closed the gap within the top guys i, I was so just kind of fixated on oh my goodness i can't believe i didn't make this team i'm crushed like everything that i was trying to work for 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 that summer like didn't pan out but if you uh i was but when i looked back and reflected on it i was really proud of the work that i did that summer i was really proud of the result that i put on hand even though the end result might have not have been what i wanted no exactly and just like you know just be proud of what you've accomplished you know what i mean some people don't see that but i mean it's great to have someone like you with that mindset you know what i mean and through your experiences to never give up and to always just you know appreciate what you have really that's the way to put it yeah. um, and it's yeah. it's not it's not it's not an easy thing to do like i can like i'm i'm in a pretty good mood today like i had uh i'm it's january i had i'm having a great training block so far it can be really easy to be super positive and say keep pushing on but at other points in times too you might say like um, I'm really exhausted. Like I'm, uh, I, I might not be having like the best training week or like I'm, I might be at the end of the block where I feel like I'm fading a bit. It can, it can be really hard to stay in that positive mindset, but if you can kind of look at it from a micro perspective and a macro perspective where you look like, all right, like today I was putting in some really good strokes. And for the last two months, like I've put in a really hard, uh, like really hard work and I've done a lot of progress. Um, where sometimes the things in the middle where it's like, oh, I'm having a, a pretty rough week. Um, if you look on, you just kind of break it, like maybe even just practice by practice or hour by hour. And then you kind of look at the whole big picture. Um, you just try and draw positives from those. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Good, uh, good uh, out of the bad. That's the way, that's the, that's the old uh, saying they always say. Um, so yeah, wow, no, that's that's really amazing though. Really amazing, like how far you've come and uh, how much effort you put into it, and uh, and you you definitely still have lots more to come. I mean, hell, San Diego, like that's gonna be you know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate. It. I'm I'm pretty excited. I get to spend two months and I get to go to an actual warm weather training camp this year. Not where I'm shoveling. Uh, I, I hope I never have to deal with snow in a warm weather training camp. Uh, you don't even want to see a shovel again for the next two months. <laughs> oh, I know. I like. <laughs> yeah, it was always uh, as a kid. It was always. Uh, really hilarious where I would, I would always go to Florida around beginning of February. And um, uh, like, especially here in Nova Scotia, it seems like we have like winter, December, January, we get fake spring and then we get second winter again. No, exactly. And, exactly. And it just goes like, uh, yeah, it was, it was really funny. I, when I was a kid, I always had to have a shovel growing up. Like we always kind of shovel the driveway, but that first year uh, I went to Florida a, uh, a snowblower was purchased real quick. <laughs> oh, no, well, there uh, comes in handy for sure. Not that you want to use it, but I mean, like, yeah, you know, exactly. that's, that's it. Um, so, yeah, so um, I was going to talk to you a little bit about your coaching. And uh, this right here actually also uh, moves into our first uh, main topic for the show today, which was um, I wanted to, uh, uh, we were going we gonna to dish a little bit on the whole uh, Vin Diesel, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson uh, situation. I'm sure, have you heard much about that whole ordeal there no they're... i don't really know too much about the the background of those two i mean like uh like i i absolutely love the rock and any any movie he's kind of ever done like even even if the movie is absolutely terrible i still love watching him on <laughs> any screen uh the the last movie i watched of his was uh uh, red notice on netflix there um uh, which uh everyone said like oh it was kind of like a so-so movie like but i was like all right it's ryan reynolds uh gal Gadot, and 
the rock johnson like what the movie could be absolutely terrible but those three are going to entertain on screen no matter what no absolutely sometimes it's not uh, uh you know for some people oh this movie was terrible but hey the rock was in it so it, it was pretty good like you know but um so yeah the whole thing with vin diesel and dwayne the rock johnson i guess it's been going on for years where basically i'm not really sure what exactly started if it's their egos or if it's just i don't know the way they work together but uh, basically so um Fast and Furious 10 is going to be the last one in the series. And uh, Dwayne Johnson, um, people call him a uh, franchise Viagra, where once he came on in Fast Five, that's when the whole series, you know, skyrocketed. Like, yeah, and, well, I'll, and it was I'll admit, the, the first Fast and Furious movie I saw was the, the seventh one. Oh, with the, yeah, so, the final yeah. Paul Walker one. Yeah. yeah so I, I saw the seventh one in theaters without actually ha- ever seeing the previous six before that. And then when I saw the seventh, I was like, all right, like, yeah, like I might not understand the full background information of it all, but I was like, all right, this is a pretty entertaining movie. And then I watched like, watched it from the start and you, you could definitely tell from like, uh, like five, I've watched them all now, but you can tell from when five, when the rock joins the cast on, it's a complete tonal shift in the way. Exactly. Like the first few are making like, you know, a hundred million, something like that. And then I think Furious seven made like well over a billion yeah. it's it's like it's like uh, one of the highest uh, uh, grossing films of all time yeah like but, i know vin uh, diesel yeah. is like he he was, he's the star of that franchise he's the face of that franchise um like him and paul walker were from like that first movie mm. and like even though they're the ones that built it up from the ground like uh, i don't think that franchise reaches the heights it would have without the rock joining the cast no exactly so i mean it, it, it wouldn't have gained a, at least a mainstream audience the way it has no, exactly. So who knows? Is it a little bit of jealousy? Like, you know, it's kind of hard to say, like, if he's jealous of like, you know, how popular The Rock is and how much how much he's helped the franchise or if it's just, I don't know, maybe just some some personal thing yeah. that we that we're not privy to or. Well, because I, I think if I remember correctly, like the fourth movie didn't do as well critically or uh, um, as well as they'd hoped for. No, exactly. And I like the fourth one. I do like the fourth one a lot. Yeah. But like the like the fourth one was kind of like the start to the shift from like, all right, this is just from girls and cars and street racing and all that stuff to kind of like where it's kind of shifted to now. Um, where um, let's be honest, those movies could have all sorts of craziness, whether it's heists or planes and driving a car military. through a building or yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got the they, they got everything, um, everything you could possibly imagine if, uh, with as much an unlimited budget as you can. No, absolutely. Um, but that fifth movie was pretty essential to the franchise because that was kind of the make or break movie where if that fifth movie would have failed critically and at the box office, there probably would not have been six, seven, eight, nine, which have they've all been money makers at this point. No, exactly. And so then some people would say, "Oh, you know, why is Vin, uh, uh, why is Vin Diesel doing this? Like, you know what I mean? Like, or, or like, why do they hate each other? Because you know they need him, this and that. For, but sometimes it's not always about business. It's always about like you know your own mental, mental. Uh, uh, state and like you know if it's just going to cause you all kinds of anxiety and stress but vin diesel actually went on uh instagram and basically put this big post because D- uh, dwayne johnson basically said i'm not coming back i wish you all the best but uh um i you know this whole thing with, with vin diesel kind of kind of uh had an effect on that and so vin diesel basically went on instagram had this big post with him and the rock saying oh we need you this and that my kids call you uncle dwayne and we need to do this for paul walker this and that and then he responded by basically saying um no no, like that's just so manipulative which i do kind of agree i mean he brought up paul walker we need yeah. to finish this for paul like it's like come on that's kind of uh, a manipulative but i was gonna ask because you actually coached hockey and did you coach uh lacrosse too or was it just yeah i've uh so i coached lacrosse uh i'm actually going to be coaching uh my university lacrosse team that i played for for the uh, the last uh, five years i'm going to be uh stepping on the bench this uh following september uh, with the team, but I coached uh, lacrosse at the, um, the U13, U14 level. I coached paddling for uh, seven years at the under 13, under 12 level. And then I coached high school hockey for uh, four seasons as well, too. Oh, okay. Right on. So, I mean, like uh, you kind of have a good, uh, uh, some, uh, you know, experience dealing with like, you know, maybe people who don't want to follow the rules. Have you dealt with a lot of that or is it? I mean, yeah. So my, the year of uh, 2019, uh, that was my first year being uh, like a senior coach on um, uh, I was always kind of like a junior coach or like a, um, like a, like a 50, 50 coach um, 
uh, all the way up uh, through before that. But that was the first year where I was kind of totally in charge of my group. But then the club ended up giving me 119 kids. Oh, okay. As a part of my group. <laughs> wow. So we had, we had uh, uh, about every single different personality you could possibly imagine from uh, like kids who thought that they were um, the next, uh, the next God in the sport. Um, even though they were only 12 years old, two kids who were just starting out, who were really shy and timid to kids who absolutely hated water. Wow. So it's like, why are you here? Kind of thing. You know what I mean? It's like a yeah. doctor who will be scared of blood or something like that. You know, yeah, like... I mean, yeah, there were, there was one time like this, this kid was a really, really nice kid, but he didn't know how to swim. Oh, uh, which, so that's, that's an issue that's, there. That's, right that's, yeah, the which is like, it's just like, yeah, like. I can, I can teach you how to paddle, but like, I also can't, like when I have a hundred kids, you can't really like a kid who can't swim. You have to have their, your eye out them every single time you're on the water. No, like, exactly. And sometimes I mean, like, you yeah, know, it's and, harder, and all, all you the, know? all the kids wear life jackets, but like, um, if a kid tips in the water, like you'll be able to identify them quickly, pick them up in their motor bros coach, get them back in and hopefully send them on their way. But yeah, like the kid who was, uh, didn't know how to swim was scared of water. And it's just, so I was like, all right, like, first of all, like you can't blame the kid on that, but like maybe the parents should have probably looked into the program a little bit more being like, Hey, like, um, 75% of this program is on the water. Yeah, no, that's it. So um, like kind so of, prepare. Yeah, I've, I've really learned how to deal with a lot of, um, different, like different situations and also like how to react with different people. Like, um, there's, there's some kids where, um, you might need to actually like get a little bit mad at them just to kind of get their point across. Um, and then there's other kids where you can't kind of react the same way to them, where you have to kind of take a more kind of gentle approach. Like every, every kid responds to something different, whether it's at the, the high school level or if it's at like the like the 13 year old age group level. Like I always liked working with the 13 year old age group because uh, for me, like they're they're old enough to be able to learn and to retain information. But then they're also still young enough that they still kind of respect authority a bit more than uh, middle teenagers do no exactly and it's weird like you know you think the older kids would would uh, kind of be a little more uh responsible and uh would uh, behave more but i mean uh for instance like I'm, I'm like you know like with this whole dwayne johnson and vin diesel thing of course they're you know they're they they make the franchise Exactly. If you had two people like that on your hockey team who are just like, you know, like one person doesn't want to come. Oh, if he's joining the team, I'm, I'm not joining the team. What would you say to that? Like, uh, would it be like, come on, guys, like, let's just do this together. Or would it be like if it's a situation where it's just going to cause one player just massive, massive stress and anxiety? Like, where would you fall on that? Yeah, well, like uh, for, for a hockey team, for example, like if two guys are already on the team, uh, you're not you're not cutting one for the other. And that's something that you kind of have to drill into the players heads right away. That is just like neither of you are going anywhere. Mm. Um, like unless one of you decides to quit the team on your own terms, like he's not going anywhere and he's not going like the, the, you, you two are going to be on the same team till the end of this season, no matter what it is A after the season, who knows uh, what will happen, but till the end of the season, you guys are on, on the same team and each of you, uh, like if they're, if they're on the team, they each bring something to the table that make the team better. Like, um, like there's not going to be a situation where one guy doesn't deserve to be on the team because the other one says so like they, they both bring something to the table and you almost have to kind of either a develop them to kind of look at it and see like, okay, like we're more, if the coaches think that we're more successful when the two of us are either on the same line or on the um, like the same team together, then there's a reason for that. Yeah, Exactly. And uh, a lot of times, like when when there's anger and emotion um, that can really cloud um, the judgment. So a lot of it's all about timing too. like um, like right after a game, if they're if it's like a like if it was an intense loss and like the two players might think that they lost because of each other. That's not the time to kind of address the situation being like, hey, guys, like um, like you guys aren't working together. Like what the what the hell? Like, uh, like, why, why aren't you guys doing this? You almost have to go like before a practice when things have kind of uh, settled down. Emotions are a little bit lower, like uh, more of a relaxed state of mind being like, hey, like um, you two are obviously not working well together. We can either 
talk this out and try and work this through, but we also can't let this impact anybody else or let it impact yourselves. No, definitely. And I mean, like, you know, there, there's definitely two sides to every argument where, I mean, like, you know, like um, one player can be really, really good, but he's also causing a whole bunch of shit within the team. So then party is like, geez, like, do we, do we kick him off or do I mean, or do we keep him on? Cause we kind of need him. Like maybe everyone else on the team is good, but they're not as, but, but, but he's like the ultimate, you know, yeah. but um, yeah, so it definitely is a tricky situation, but then also yeah, you also look the, out for. Yeah. With the Vin Diesel and Dwayne Johnson situation, like uh, obviously it's a lot different because we're not just talking about like a, like a peewee or a bantam like a hockey it's a billion team, dollar example. franchise we're talking, <laughs> about a bill, we're talking about a lot of money and a lot of vested interests at stake here yeah exactly but the two of them almost kind of have to say like okay like um can we put our differences aside to either make another billion dollar movie um or if this is something that um isn't going to be uh worked out um like like how 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 do we make this so this doesn't affect what we do next? No, exactly. And I mean, like uh, I remember, uh, I'm not sure if you remember, but a few years ago there was this big thing with uh, Tyrese Gibson who plays a uh, Roman in the movies. He there was this big thing with him and Dwayne Johnson where he basically went on social media and said, "Listen, if Dwayne Johnson comes back for this movie, I'm I, then then I'm I'm leaving," kind of thing. So there's also that, I mean, like, I'm not sure if the rock's hard to work with or if people are just jealous of his success or whatever it is. But with that situation there, I mean, Rome, I mean, as much as I like Roman in the movies and Tyrese is a good actor, he's, he's, if you took him out, you wouldn't even know, know yeah. that he was gone kind of thing. So, I yeah. mean, I mean, in that some, situation, some people take a really hard stance on some of that stuff and it all depends on, on people and players and stuff. Like um, I think we see a lot of this very prevalent in the NBA where um, like a lot like players players voices and players uh, decisions are they have they weigh a lot of impact because they have the power to do it yeah um, and it's it's um, I think it's I think it's more closer to probably like uh, like a professional basketball franchise than a hockey team because in a hockey team you have 20 guys um, if you have one player that decides that he doesn't want to play for this team for whatever reason there's still 19 other guys that, um, like the, the team will still have success with um, or without them kind of thing. Yeah. Um, where we're seeing in either, whether it's a movie franchise or an NBA franchise, um, like, um, you take, you take one of the best players off of an NBA team when the, and the teams are only around 10 and like your starters play so much more minutes, it has a significant impact on the team. Where if you take out like a main cast member of a movie for a dispute or whatever reason, and they say, I'm done, I'm not, I'm not shooting this movie. I'm not playing this role. Well, it, it, it leaves, it leaves the, the cast and the directors in a much tougher situation when you have like six star members of like a, or a main core group of a cast and one of them decides to leave when they know that when they know how much power and influence they have, it makes their, their voice and their decision um, much more impactful. No, definitely. And I mean, even with that Tyree situation, I mean, people will, will be looking at that at a, at a business perspective. They're like, okay, so uh, Tyree said he's not come back if Dwayne, if, if, if a Dwayne returns. So who do we lose? Well, Dwayne Johnson, as, as we said, is, is franchise Viagra. So, I mean, like, you know, obviously from a business point of view, you're going to say, well, keep Dwayne Johnson kind of thing. But uh, so with this whole situation, I mean, like, you know, if you were, if you were uh, Vin Diesel or, or, or Dwayne, the rock, and you were in this dispute, whatever's going on, because I, I'm actually not even sure myself why they're mad at each other, if it's an ego thing or if it's just they, they, they just have two different personalities. Would you want to come back or would you just say like, yeah, you know, like, you know, there, there's a lot of money at stake. There's one more movie left. Maybe I'll just do it. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, like um, people, people are naturally like looking out for themselves mm -hmm. and their own best vested interest. Um, if uh, for for me, for example, like if like if let's just say I'm Dwayne Johnson and I'm looking at this movie and I was like, all right, like here's kind of the two options. Like I can step aside and leave from this franchise and whatever dispute or feud that I might have, 
uh, I might, I might not have to deal with it anymore. I might be resolved. I might be done with it. I take myself out of the situation. If that's, what's better for me mentally, then that's just the, or for my lifestyle for whatever it is. And that's the choice I make. But if I think that, okay, I can put this aside, I can still do this and get a big payout out of this. Um, and if that's what I think is going to be better for me at the end of the day, I think people are just going to do what's better for themselves in that situation, especially when, uh, their voice and their say has more power. No, exactly. And I mean, like, you know, at, at uh, uh, the end of the day, it's always not always about the money. Sometimes it's about like, you know, m- money don't mean shit if you're not happy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, if, you're, exactly. if you're miserable, then like, you know, why are you, you know, why are we doing this? You know, like not, not gonna, of course, there's lots of money at, at stake here. I mean, like you can make one movie or, or, or more money off this one movie than anybody would make in their entire lifetime. But at the end of the day, yeah what's more important your own well-being or or your financial situation it's definitely um it's definitely complicated but i mean like you know as you said it's always good to look out for yourself and that's what most people would do nowadays you know it's definitely might not be an easy decision but it's ultimately the right one in my opinion anyway but a question for you guys the viewers i'll put a i'll put a poll up on our spotify uh what do you think do you think dwayne the rock johnson or and vin diesel should resolve their few or um uh, should they just put aside their differences and make uh, their last movie or should it just be like, nope, just uh, have Dwayne call it quits because mentally it's not healthy for him. Let us know on Spotify and uh, maybe put on Instagram, whatever, and we'll, and tell us your thoughts. Uh, so our last topic today is um, we, we talked a lot about sports for this one here, <laughs> which is really good. Uh, but uh, Brett is also, you're also uh, big on Spider-Man, eh? You're also uh, really. Yeah, I am. I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. Like, um, for me, like the original Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies were uh, like some of my favorite movies growing up. Um, like uh, my mom used to have like uh, below our TV. It was like a, it was a cabinet with uh, just filled with old VHS films. And there was only a few that I actually owned myself. But the uh, the original Tobey Maguire Spider-Man one and the Spider-Man 2 uh, with uh, the one where they introduced uh, Alfred Molina and Doc. Oh, Hawk. yes. Um, that was kind of the one of the last VHSs that I had because solely after that, it was kind of trans- uh, transitioning the DVD. And then um, next thing you know, it's Blu-ray and everything's streamed nowadays. It's just... Nowadays, it's like Paramount Plus and all this. Like, yeah, <laughs> Disney all, all, Plus. yeah, the amount of different streaming sites right now, like uh, I can't even I keep find up with this them. Pre- pretty hilarious. I was watching. Uh, watching netflix yesterday and it was like oh your your plan's going up to uh 2099 a month and next thing you know it's like okay if you have netflix you have disney plus hbo or crave or whatever it is um like the the whole reason why these streaming channels were so popular off the start was because it was just like oh like don't pay the uh big price for cable whatever it is like just what watch what you want to watch here uh, with like one or two or two channels and the next thing we know like with all these streaming sites if you have three or four of them you're pretty much paying the same price of cable anyway <laughs> no exactly so party is like i mean like you know if i only watch one thing on cable i'm not gonna bother paying all this you know shit ton of money if if there's only one show i watch we're easily uh, i could very easily just go on paramount plus or netflix yeah, or exactly. disney plus like, and watch I, it I think like eventually you're, you're going to start seeing in the next because uh as soon as like a new thing like where it's just like okay like you see something on crave that you really want to watch uh you subscribe to it for a few months and then you still keep that and then you see something else and then next thing you know you check your bill and you got your subscribe to three four channels you realize all right what's what's on the chopping block here yes something's got to go it's just a matter of what do you yeah. use the most and uh, what do you not you know uh but uh, you said so f- so for uh, spider-man you were uh, real real intrigued by the whole multiverse which you saw no way home i take it yeah. did you oh yeah. yes i did yeah, yeah absolutely I, I think, okay yeah. i think anybody who's wanted to see the movie now has seen the movie without the spo- so i i saw it on the day it came out um i like i i normally don't take practice off for very many things there's like uh, like I, I'm, I'm very committed to showing up the practice day in day out. Um, I'll admit I took the afternoon off to make sure that I could go to that three 30 showing of <laughs> Spider-Man that, that first one showing at Dartmouth crossing, because there was no way in hell I was letting anybody, whether it be social media, someone texting me, just hearing it word of mouth, whatever it is, nobody was spoiling that movie for me. No, God. Was, and you know, it's a big deal when Brett Himmelman, RBC <laughs> Olympian, and you know, <laughs> won all these, you know, 
a very accomplished medalist is ditching was, a practice yeah, to taking, go see Spider-Man. Taking That's one we, practice off to go. Yeah. It, it's, I was I, like, I, I normally don't look like I'll like, there's very few movies that I'll like go to the, the theater and see and like sit down and really take it all in. So like get the snacks, all of it. Um, Marvel movies for me are usually kind of the big ticket item that gets me to, especially now with during the pandemic. Um, where it's just like theaters have been closed for so long. I was like, all right, the next time I'm going in the movie theater, as soon as they announced Spider-Man No Way Home, the date coming out, I was like, all right, that's the next time I'm stepping into a theater. And it essentially saved the movie theaters too. And I mean, like, you know, I even mentioned this uh, in, uh, in our intro, the last few, few episodes, we've always had some sort of conversation about Spider-Man. And so yeah. some people say, oh, you're talking about Spider-Man again. It's like, well, there's nothing really big in movies right well, now I mean, aside it's, from it's Spider-Man. It's the highest grossing movie of all time. And exactly. a lot of theaters are still at half capacity. No, exactly. Like that was something. Like, I mean, like, you know, as, as soon as I heard when it was coming out and all the restrictions and stuff yeah. of that, I said, oh, it's not making past a billion yeah, dollars. And like, here we are. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're, we're talking, it's making big money with all these obstacles against. And I mean, um, like, I think it draws from so many different people. Like I, like the, the original Tobey Maguire movies, like that was kind of like the first, like that kind of changed superhero movies, that first Spider-Man movie. Like um, it was, it was so different in a way that it was like, all right, like you had such an opposing villain in um, like William Defoe played Green Goblin, perfect, oh, in the original man. Spider-Man and in No Way Home. Like, I think he was more terrifying in My no God, Way Home. like <laughs> I think I, I, it, if someone took a shot every time I praise Willem Dafoe in this movie, like I think nobody would have a liver left. Like, <laughs> oh my god, just I, I, the the dude. I even said too. I said I want to see a Green Goblin movie now after this, after No Way Home. Willem Dafoe nailed it. Yeah. And so, like, um, you, uh, you said too, you were interested in talking about like like the uh, multiverse. So, yeah, of all I the mean- villains they brought back, which one were you the most excited to see? Was it Willem Dafoe or? So I was. Because uh, like I, I knew that the Green Goblin and Doc Ock were going to be in it for sure. Um, like it was awesome to see like all of them. Um, I, I think for me, like really like just bringing Doc Ock back was just like for me, he was a villain that was like, all right, like, yeah, he was a villain, but he was kind of like a relatable villain because he, he was he was a scientist working on his project. And it wasn't like he was trying to do like world domination or trying to like kill off a population of people or a planet or whatever it is it was he was just simply trying to go for his dream and he wasn't letting anybody stay in his way no exactly and then it was just kind of an unfortunate uh uh, situation all around and i really love that they yeah like alfred Molina. i was going to say i said uh there's certain exceptions to a lot of uh villains where like you know if you're uh, rebooting it just scrap the old and put in and uh and you know cast it yeah. with something new alfred molina would be one of those exceptions because i think that was just yeah i, I and, think he and absolutely he, nailed and it it was really nice seeing a lot of these villains get a full circle um except with will with green goblin like he, he was the one who was purely nasty evil from the first movie it just carried um, on to this one <laughs> yeah like uh playing the sympathetic father father role and um, um, activating the, the glider to try and uh, slice uh, Tobey Maguire in half there. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and then like at the end there, it was like, wow, like that was uh, um, like, yeah, it's truly evil villain. Uh, the, one, uh, the one villain I would love to see again, and I think the, this is the only latest Spider-Man villain that even can be on the same level as uh, the foe of Molina. Uh, that was Michael Keaton in Homecoming. Oh yeah. yes, well, and, Michael Keaton, one, man. And he's one that doesn't get talked uh, about too much because he was in a one-off movie. Um, like he wasn't a part of the whole multiverse. He wasn't a part of the cinematic universe um, uh, any um, any more than he was just in that movie. Like I know in the post-credits uh, scenes, um, he was talking with I, I think it was what was going to be the future Scorpion at some point in time. Michael Mando, the actor, yeah. Plays. yeah. And then um, uh, Michael Keaton also um, is in Morbius too. Yes, that's right too. So I mean, like, um, so what are we- I, I would love to see his character come back because um, he absolutely killed it as the vulture oh and, my gosh yeah, like, like it was so and, good like it was like like homecoming was a little bit worried about being bald because there were so many big picture things going on like spider-man's a friendly neighborhood hero which um is one of my favorite parts about him is that like um he's not someone who's just trying to help save the universe all the time he's someone who's trying to keep someone from getting their purse robbed or their <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. And not um, be like, you know, basically brought to Germany by uh, Tony Stark. Yeah. To fight no like, war, you know? Oh, like when they brought back Spider-Man, I was I was a little bit worried that it was just like, all oh, right, is it going to get bogged down too much by everything that's going on with the Infinity Stones and Iron Man and Thor and the whole universe? But they really cut out a niche by having just an amazing villain with homecoming with michael keaton he absolutely plays that role perfect as like oh like um his his daughter is dating peter parker but like he's also a villain by night and it's like he also still do um still has kind of the same uh motive as alfred molina it's just like all right like he's not looking at destroying the world he's just trying to make a living for himself and uh, like he's not like, oh, I'm gonna kill Spider Man now. Like, doesn't that like he, yeah, he never starts off that way? Yeah, he's he's like a he's a he's a blue collar worker trying to feed his family, and then when he loses his contract, he he finds he finds a way to make ends meet. No, exactly. And then and um, uh, and, th- and they carry on with that uh, with kind of kind of down that evil land, kind of the kind of the same way they did with Alfred Molina and Spider Man too. No, absolutely. Uh, I'd say probably my favorite Michael Keaton moment from Homecoming was when uh, he drops Peter Peter and his daughter off at the dance. And he's like, oh, uh, honey, uh, you go on in. I'm going to talk to Peter for a second. He basically just threatens oh, him. Like, yeah. you enjoy, yeah. you you give my daughter a good time, blah, 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 this and that, or I will kill you. It's just yeah. chills. Oh, yeah. Like, like, that scene gave me goosebumps when I saw that. I was just like, oh, my. And, like, Michael Keaton plays it perfectly. But, like, it's it's you, like... The, a, a lot of problem, especially with the early on Marvel villains, but you didn't really see the the human side to it all. No, you exactly. Really, you really because like he even gives Spider Man a chance, being like, "Hey, like I'm not going to go put a bullet in your brain right now. Like um, I'm going to give you a second chance as a human. I'm not just um, speaking as a deranged, crazy villain. It's just like, all right, like you you take my daughter to the dance and stuff, and I'm going to look a blind eye to this." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No. So it's definitely interesting, though. I mean, like how they brought so many villains back, but then also forgot some of the good ones. You know what I mean? Like they 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 could have brought him back in some way, uh, shape or form. And one that I would like to see would have been uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2, uh, Dane DeHaan's uh, Green Goblin. Yes, what was your opinion that, on that? Very underrated. Absolutely. Um, like, I, I mean, was terrified. I was scared shitless when I first yeah, saw that movie. theaters. Like, I mean, I thought that like when that movie came out, like I thought that it was almost a little bit. Well, when The Amazing Spider-Man came out, it was almost like a little bit too soon for a reboot Mm -hmm. from the Tobey Maguire series. And then when they brought back Green Goblin, I was like, all right, like you already had like the William Dafoe Green Goblin. You also had like New Goblin with James Franco and Spider-Man 3. Um, Like this is a character that's already been like done three movies in the last 10 years how can i keep it fresh (laughs) yeah but he was he had such a different approach to it that it was like i i wish we could have got to see more of it because amazing man spider-man 2 i actually enjoyed that movie but it was a mess of a movie yeah yeah i mean like it definitely did have problems but i certainly do i really really like that movie yeah it, it was it was an enjoyable movie they just needed to cut out maybe one or two like aspects of it like same, rhino same as, yeah exactly the, the <laughs> rhino was it, it just kind of seemed like oh we're throwing him in there for we 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 promised paul giamatti this much money we gotta we gotta throw him in there exactly um, throw him a ball throw him a ball kind of thing you know yeah, what i mean exactly. <laughs> like like same with the uh, toby Maguire spider-man 3 like i actually enjoyed that movie but it just they had too too many pieces to the puzzle for one movie like uh like they had sandman they had venom they had new goblin in there it was just kind of and then like peter dealing with the symbiote himself too no um, exactly it, there was so was, much at stake too, you know? ma- too many pieces for a two hour and 20 minute movie and th- that's what i thought the same thing of amazing spider-man too but yeah like um i i, I fought like the new green goblin in the, the reboot i, I wish we could have got to see him at least one more time no absolutely Cause, well cause i mean like, like they had press. plans in Amazing Spider-Man three, which got canceled, he was going to come back and he was going to be a like 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 the main villain of that. Yeah, and unfortunately, that didn't pan yeah, out. So I was hoping we would have saw him again. Yeah, just uh, that movie ended up just not making as much money and wasn't the the newer movies wasn't as critically reviewed. Like when I I, I watched those movies twice now, and when I watched them the first time, like I think I was comparing them too much to uh, the original Tobey Maguire movies, which I absolutely loved. Oh and yeah, and like, it's hard oh, to compete, yeah. like, you know. Yeah, it was like, oh, this is not the same. Like Andrew Garfield, like Andrew Garfield, I think was a great Spider-Man, just put into maybe not the best storylines and like the first Amazing Spider-Man, I think was a, a great movie, but I just think the the some of the timing was just kind of off with it. 
Which is funny because that was actually my favorite Spider-Man movie before No Way Home, which a lot of people think like, wow, that was your favorite Spider-Man. Like, no, I'm I, I'm in the minority. I love that one a lot. It yeah. was really, really. I mean, well, I, yeah. I think when you kind of accept a little bit of the goofiness of the lizard character itself. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, he wasn't like, the best. But I mean, I, I certainly liked him a lot. I, 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 I thought he was really yeah, good. I, I liked him in No Way Home and I liked him in The Amazing Spider-Man. Like once, once you realize kind of how ridiculous the character is itself and you kind of like. You almost kind of sometimes with certain movies, you have to kind of almost like let your voice of reason kind of disappear a bit. No, exactly. Yeah, just kind of sit along and enjoy the ride. No, it, it, and that's exactly it. So, um, we'll, uh, so uh, I'll say to you, any of the villains that uh, do you think we might see any more of them somewhere down the line? And who would you like to see again? And maybe like, I mean, I don't know. with the, uh, I, I hate giving out way more spoilers, but um, I, I, w- I would like to see Venom done right. <gasps> yes mm, yeah that was um, someone actually said that why did two for grace come back i'm like well well because did you see spider-man 3 <laughs> like yeah <laughs> i mean done. i mean i thought that he was just like he, he like he's a good actor and like venom is obviously a great screen character but it just seemed like just it was it, it was too rushed and oh it was 3. way too rushed like they could have done almost so much like, once, once the whole Sandman storyline and Ben's real killer was all sorted out and dealing with James Franco dealing, like knowing that Spider-Man, like it was Peter Parker who killed his father. Mm-hmm. Um, like Venom just seemed like it was an afterthought where I think he really needed to be the center of the screen. Yeah, exactly. And I actually really enjoyed the new Tom Hardy Venom movie. Um, I know it's got a kind of, kind of bit of mixed reviews, but like, the character itself is pretty goofy. I'm, I'm, I haven't seen uh, Let There Be Carnage yet. I, I never really, saw it yet either. No, I really I'm dying to see, to see it, that. But I, I do like Woody Harrelson, and I saw the trailer for it, and it looks terrifying. No, absolutely. And I mean, hey, if they can bring him back, because I mean, like, you know, it's Woody Harrelson, you know what I mean? Yeah. If we can work him in there somehow, you know what I mean? That'd be a really... Yeah, like, I, w- I would like to see the Venom character get proper screen justice with... <laughs> yeah versus spider-man absolutely yeah. so and, and it, it, it can't be like a, a second or a third character i they need to make a spider-man versus venom movie no definitely almost like a batman versus superman except to actually make it good yeah exactly <laughs> i'll just i was gonna say it right there yeah, i, I yeah, know it's but, two different universes but oh yeah 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 there's just batman versus superman like the i think the biggest problem with dcu movie they, they try to be different from marvel um, and then it just doesn't bit, work being a bit darker and like, but it's just, it just turned out being almost like too dark. It wasn't enjoyable and too loud that you're kind of being like, what's, what's going on. Exactly. That's literally it. That's actually exactly it. So, uh, so yeah. you say, yeah, we'd love to see Venom again. And I definitely agree with that. Like, hopefully, hopefully they work something out. Well, I mean, no way homes and credit scene. That's a little, or yeah, the, ex- the post credit exactly. scene. That's something. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it'd be, it'd be really cool. at like, uh, I was very like hesitant about the no way home. Cause I was like, okay, you're bringing back so many characters, so many villains. Like there's going to be a very, there's going to be a very fine line between this movie is going to be the greatest superhero movie of all time, or it could be a complete utter failure. Like there, there, there wasn't a lot of in the middle area between those two. And I was but glad they to see balance it, it out young. perfectly though. Like it was yeah. very, very well done. So definitely, hopefully we get to see more of the multiverse. Well, mm-hmm. actually we will Dr. Strange multiverse of madness. Yeah. I mean, I saw, saw the trailer for that, that uh, that's going to be a crazy movie. I oh, think. I'm so excited for that. And this whole multiverse idea, I just can't wait to explore it some more. And, uh, yeah, so that will do it up for uh, today's uh, yeah. episode. Uh, I'd yeah, like to thank my guest, Brett Himmelman. Brett, where can people find you? Can they find you on social media anywhere? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you very much for uh, having me on the show. I appreciate it a lot. Like uh, my, uh, yeah, my social media channels are just Brett Himmelman. It's my name. Uh, it's Brett with one T. Um, uh, a lot of, I, there's people that have known me for years, like even members of my family, like extended family who've known me for almost 24 years still spell my name with two t's on christmas cards and stuff like that and I'm, like, I'm like i actually right, did like, on your contacts i actually put it as two t's to start and then i, I, I and i know oh, that's crap. kind of the general way to spell and the uh the lame duck joke that i always say is that um when uh my parents were uh when i was born they could only afford one t uh for the birth certificate so <laughs> um that's, oh, well, that's, there. that's uh but yeah it's uh just brett one t himmelman um yeah if uh, anybody is uh 
uh, wants to reach out or um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a friendly person, whether you want to talk about sports or I, I could probably talk about Spider-Man for probably three, four hours too. Like uh, I know my girlfriend's definitely heard me talk about it more than enough times, especially leading up to this movie. I was like, I am so excited for this. Like, look, there's this and that and that and that. And she's just like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> uh, she, she, she went to the movie with me and uh, I, she, she enjoyed it as much as I did. So. Oh, well, there, that's good then. That's good. Bring, bring us together. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, there. So thank you guys very much for joining us today. Thank you again to Brett for coming on. Uh, hope to have you again on sometime soon, maybe even in person uh, yeah, uh, one need- of these days again. Uh, definitely. I would, I would love to make my way back at the, I had a great time, Mayor Machi, just for the couple of days that I was in there. Like, uh, I wanted to make it up for some cross country skiing this winter, but, uh, with the latest pandemic kind of restrictions, all that, it kind of made a, a trip a bit tougher, but, uh, I heard there's some pretty good salmon fishing in the summer. So I, uh, no, feel free to come up. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, mean, uh, we'll definitely... I, I definitely, definitely hope to be back for some sort of event or purpose, or even if it's just for my own, uh, my own sake. No, well, there we go. Absolutely. No, well, there. So enjoy yourself. Um, yeah. So yeah, so stay tuned for next week's episode. We, we will have uh, award winning screenwriter, Paul Pedito uh, and a good uh, uh, writer friend of mine. Uh, we are going to be discussing, uh, what are we going to be discussing? Oh yes. We're, we're going to be discussing don't look up on uh, Netflix and we will also uh, be talking about the whole, uh, yeah, what are we talking about? Jeez, I didn't even write that down. Uh, yeah, you'll see it on social media. I actually didn't uh, mark it down. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Paul, 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 Paul's great. He's going to be a great guest and uh, we're excited to have him on here. So thank you again to Brett. And yeah, thank uh, again, you very much for having me on. For those of you watching the video version, you may have seen this screen here with a give. He's he's. Gib, are you sleeping? I don't know if he's still sleeping or if he's just he's he he's our sound guy. There he is, right there. Yeah, I'm still I'm still here. There, a Gib's our uh, tech man, so he's uh yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Thank thank you very much to both of you, and uh, yeah, hope to hope to stay in touch and see you guys soon. All right, sounds Thanks good, man. Out, man. Have a good one.